record. Okie dokes. All right, I'm going to hop off now. Edwina, over to you. Okay, hi everyone. I can't see who's um, popped in, but I'm sure Gabby's going to tell me. And as Gabby said before, I'm happy for you to jump in, ask questions along the way, and um, just feel free to chat. Also type in all your questions. So I'll stop at the end of London. And then if there's any questions I haven't answered, we can go through there. So today's Pro Connect is about my experience at the London Design Week and Paris Maison Objet. And just to really hopefully energize you and inspire you to feel that there are other ways to get design knowledge apart from Instagram and um, Pinterest. So let's go. So I was so fortuitous that literally four hours after I got off the plane in London, I went down to the King's Road and I went into Designer Guild. I'm not sure if um, anyone knows Designer Guild, but it's maybe you should start writing down some of these names to go back and do some research if you haven't. But I know we did discuss her in Design History. And there is Trisha Guild, an icon to me. Not only when I was studying textile design, I was very much into um, Trisha. She's written 30 books, one that her 30th she's just released on Bloom. And she has this fabulous, uh, it's about two or three story store on King's Road on the corner. And with all her homewares, all her textiles, all her paint colors, um, wallpapers, just it's just a fabulous, fabulous um, showroom and there's Trisha so I couldn't help myself got a photo with Trisha but I also took lots of photos of her materials boards because I think that's something as designers and students we really have to keep working to perfect our material boards so she had these fabulous material boards just showing how she layers fabrics and wallpapers and her paint colors and if you do look at my Instagram um, you will see I put a whole lot of other um, mood boards but there's a shot of us behind some of the mood boards um, and of course Trisha Guild. So what I was really in London was apart from going down King's Road and all those fun things you do in London was to go to the London Design Week. And it was kind of, um, I suppose, a COVID silver lining, you could say, because uh, it was, we were, I was able to do London Design Week and Paris Maison Objet. London Design Week is always around March and then they do it again in September. And then, um, Paris Maison Objet is normally in January, but they was cancelled through COVID, so they brought that into March. So it was worthwhile getting on that flight, doing the 20 whatever hours um, to be able to see both design fairs. So London Design Week is a five-day program, and it is in the Chelsea Design Centre, which is about four floors of showrooms. It is definitely heavily pushed towards soft furnishings, which the English are very much into soft furnishings. So who, as you know, I teach soft furnishings. I love soft furnishings. So for me, this was like a bit of a mecca. And um, they have these fabulous programs. It's really well organized. And what is so wonderful is that you're basically going to where you see or everything. Where we go to our um, textile wholesalers and furniture wholesalers here, we just see a little snippet. We might see like a little 15 centimetre by 15 centimetre swatch. Here we're seeing like three metre long of lengths of the fabric. So it's really wonderful just to be able to embrace all of that. So they had put on a whole series of talks. Um, three of them I'll just briefly discuss now. One of them, this is uh, Mini Camp. And for those who haven't followed my Instagram, Mini Camp is Kit Camp's daughter. And she basically really runs a lot of the Ferndale Group of Hotels design projects. Her mother seems to be more into licensing, so I'll talk about that in a minute. So Kit, um, Mini was discussing 
COVID, what it meant to them as they were all in hotels, they're their own client, how they had to diversify. This was the first time they actually did residential projects. She said, oh my gosh, this is incredible. You residential interior designers, I take my hat off to you. It is so hard because when they were doing their hotel work, they just had to really work for themselves. Then they're their own client. But with residentials, she said, I actually think you need um, a degree in psychology too. So they did, she talked a little bit about a residential project and on her screen there she's talking about a project she's done um, for Bloomsbury Publishing so if you look on her Instagram you'll see some of these um, textiles now on the furniture in the Bloomsbury um, project she's just finished but what was my biggest takeaway and you'll see that on my Instagram was the fact that she said that every design work starts with the color wheel everything they do begins with the color wheel so of course, they're very long on color. That's what they've made their name for. But she really said that's how we structure it. We all structure it. We begin it with the color wheel. So she's highly entertaining, someone to watch, really quite quirky, young and energetic. And I just think she's just definitely keep your eye on mini camp. Then on the other side of the screen, we've got her mother, Kit Camp, which many of you would know. She's published a book, or many books, and she's the one that has really put this layered quirky effect into the Firmdale and revolutionised boutique hotels. She's discussing her collaboration with um, Annie Selke, who's an American rug designer, and they designed a whole lot of rugs. So what happened with um, Minnie and Kemp, the whole family during COVID went to their um, Caribbean house, as you do, and they were like, well, what are we going to do? We, we've got a hotel's real clothes. We've got, we can't do anything. Um, you know, they were joking that maybe Kit will learn how to basket weave and Minnie will be a deep sea um, diver and how learn how to weld. And so this is where collaboration and other um, ideas came from them. So these rugs were all designed through COVID in lockdown, all through the internet. And Minnie's residential projects, again, were all done through the internet, through lockdown. In the middle is the iconic Dame Zandra Rhodes. So Zandra Rhodes, um, amazing woman, she founded the Fashion and Textile Museum in London. She began her life as an interior design, as an interior textile designer. And she couldn't make any money of it. So she went into fashion, iconic fashion designer of the 70s. And now she's come back to design her own textiles. You're seeing a lot of these um, wovens now um, in a lot of English interior textile designers ranges because they've now reopened up a lot of the old mills in Manchester. So wovens are more the type of fabrics that you will put on your sofas where normally prints will be your throw cushions and, and that sort of um, curtains. So she designed all these fabulous new jacquard waves from a new a, an old Manchester um, mill and she lodged them at this place um, at George Spencer Designs and I said to I was so lucky because last year I had this fabulous client where I think I spent forty thousand dollars on um, fabrics trims tassels from George Spencer design so I said to Tim who runs it I said Tim you've got to get me a photo with um Zandra Ashley. he goes well since you've probably been our biggest Australian client last year I will make sure so i so buzzed to get this photo huge icon and just great to hear her talk about her experience in design and where she sees her textiles um placed so not only were there talks, there were workshops. And these are some photos of some workshops that I attended. Um, on both sides of the screen, that is in Morrison Co. So you would have learned in design history. I keep bringing back to design history because everything actually does go back to either design history or color. And um, so arts and crafts, William Morris, they had all these workshops on block printing. So to your left of your screen, you can see me block printing wallpaper and the way they would have done it in back in the day with arts and crafts. You can see the wallpaper behind the guy drying in um, lengths. 
And then on the other side was Lino Print. Here we were testing out all their new paint colors and doing it on some of the most iconic William Morris textiles like um, a strawberry thief and other iconic textiles. So if you are really interested in William Morris designs, I know it's um, domestic textiles in Australia that actually uh, represent William Morris. So basically everyone that I discussed, you can find their products in Australia. And then Santa ABI. So we know ABI um, based in uh, the Gold Coast. And I know a lot of students know ABI because I see their little ABI um, gold little medallions in their mood boards. So they did a mood boarding workshop and it was really interesting. The first thing they give you is pick a hardware, so pick a tap, then go and here's your color wheel. Now find the complementary of that color wheel and make your whole mood board working the complementary. So I picked this tap, as you can see, it's orange. The complementary is blue. So they were like pushing all the blue. So that was really interesting where I've just come from a talk with Mini Camp about the color wheel, hear about mood boarding, beginning with the color wheel. So it felt like color wheel was just the big vibe in London. So in the Chelsea Design Centre, um, you can see on this, you see all these balls. This is actually a reflection on the glass um, it's like four stories and there's just design um, showrooms all around. They're like little shops and it's just filled with interior design, inspiration and products. So like the English love, maximalism is huge. Lots and lots of colour and just layered upon layered upon layered of quirkiness. And so I'd say there's huge amount of whimsy lots of layering, huge amount of trims, trims like everywhere. Um, you can see like trims around cushions, trims around lampshades, trims around um, the edges of sofas. Obviously this is a mood board filled with trims, um, just trims around everywhere you can find. Ruffles and trims was very, very big. So Happenstance always happens when you go to these design fairs, you meet really interesting people and one who I know before I went over there is Tigger Hall. So Tigger Hall has um, a textile design um, label called Nine Muses and she had an appointment with the Ferndale design team, which is Kit Kent and Minnie's design team. And um, she said, oh, Dwayne, do you want to come along? So there's no way I was going to miss that opportunity. So I went to their fabulous, it's one beautiful English home in Knightsbridge. And this is their board table where you can see all Tigger's Nine Muse fabrics. And then on the, the edge of the board table, there's all the books stacked up there. Um, here they are sourcing for projects. So this is their whole um, design team. And it was really interesting listening to them going, that's going to be great for the bedhead. What about that um, chair we've got in Ham Yard in the foyer? That needs changing. In the such and such restaurant, we need to now really do that banquette. How about using that? And it was really interesting watching them use their fabrics, um, sourcing with their fabrics and really working with colour and how they were going to play that up. Oh no, that's a bit dirty. We need that a bit more cleaner. Oh, I really like that white background. That's going to be better with this. And just listening to how they were selecting, using all the elements and principles of design to get them to that final outcome. So the photos on the right, the top one is myself, um, is obviously myself. Um, you've got Tigger Hall and you've got Mini Camp. And then below is an ex ISCD teacher who works for the Firmdale um, group, um, Anne Marie. So it was kind of a buzz when she's like, I know you. I'm like, I know you. And then we sort of worked out that it was from ISCD. So that was a fun couple of hours playing with the design team. And then whenever I go away, I always look at the art. I think the art will tell you so much about trends, where things are going, um, how to stretch your design mind. And this, I went to loads of art, but this is probably my three top ones in London. 
So the top one at the top is the Yinka Shinabari. Um, it was an installation. It was a library. And he's known for all this wax cloth. It's a lot of discussion about um, immigration and European colonism. But this particular installation was to celebrate all the creative immigrants into the UK that have brought wonderful things to the UK. So there was like from photographers, designers, artists, writers, all creative people right across the sphere um, that were either originated from the UK or immigrated. To the UK and their names were written in gold on all these fabulous um, textiles and me loving textiles I was thinking gosh this is my dream client could you imagine a client saying to you I want you to go and cover all my books in my library go source the textiles um, that's where my head was going but so think about Yinka Shinabari because he's going to come up again in the next slide below is Louise Bourgeois now Louise Bourgeois has been one of my um, art design, uh, fine art icons for a long time. But this was a retrospective of all her textile works. And I think it's really interesting to see how she plays with balance and scale, layers, textiles, how she um, manipulates fabric. And it's the whole show was like about two and a half levels of just all her textiles framed in different sizes this is just a, a little one little story um but really if she was someone that i thought i've got to go back i was very into her when i was at grad school and i really thought wow she's really showing us a lot about how pattern and textiles work well together and then to my right is francis bacon so he had this fabulous retrospective at the royal academy of art and what I never knew about Francis Bacon was the fact that he began his life as an interior designer. So when you look at his work, one, you see he knows how to work with colour beautifully, but two, he really understands spatial awareness and he's always sort of has this sort of element of um, interior sort of furniture that anchors it in an abstract way, each work, but then has this fabulous negative space. These were mainly the, the work that I love, uh, his 60s and 70s artwork. This particular one was done in the 70s, but look at these colors and look how they're resonating now. So here you've got this orange. And so if you just look at the two top interior designers and I mean, art, fine artists, what they're showing in art, and then how sketch has been transformed using these concepts. So for those of you that don't know Sketch, maybe it's a good thing to um, Google Sketch. It is um, the most Instagrammable restaurant in the world. It's designed by interior designer, a Paris-based interior designer, India Madave. And she um, is half, she was born in Tehran, grew up in Paris. And she really put Millennial Pink on the map seven years ago. It was this restaurant with this Millennial Pink that really um, threw Millennial Pink into the world stratosphere and became so popular. And then two weeks before, she um, they revealed this new interior of the restaurant so for seven years which is a long time to have the most instagrammable restaurant interior they totally changed it but look at the colors they've changed it they've changed it to like the francis bacon orange you've mm -hmm. got um artworks by yenka shinabari all around the um, walls you've got the um fabrics all inspired by um african um wax cloth and obviously you can see his fine artwork here but just the materials obviously the floor stayed the same it's stunning but the yellows the golds and how this is actually gold but reflects off this beautiful mandarin colored wall that gives it this sort of pinkish um tone oh okay sure. i think someone should turn off their um their um voice if they can i don't know who that is um okay so that's sketched and it was amazing experience to be there it's like a two and a half hour high tea but what's even more is just the way of the interior design 
So just a bit of a wrap from London. Um, they're always really strong with their material boards. Um, again, more and more. You can never have enough row cushions, as you can see here. These are all different um, showrooms and you can see how many sort of 65 by 65 um, cushions they have. And the way that you can juxtapose those, so many different concepts and put them together. So Gabby, are there any questions? Hi, uh, no one's put one in, but I'd like to know, so out of all of those things that you did, what, what was the highlight? What, what did you find the most fantastic for you? Oh, there isn't a particular highlight. Like I think going to Sketch was a highlight for me because I, I read so much about it for so long and I was almost a little bit upset that I wasn't going to see the most Instagrammable rest, um, it, interior but then I was so lucky to see what the new is and the exciting um, and then I suppose going to the arts there was also the Francis Bacon was mind-blowing mm -hmm. and then just really the I'd say mini camp was probably one of my um, key talks that I really gravitated to there was also another wonderful talk by another interior designer on design industry practice and her spin on it so that was really interesting so there wasn't one thing so no. it was a, there was something amazing on everything and of course meeting people like Trisha Guild and Zandra Rhodes and you know those sorts of things and Kit Camp that's always you know a little bit of I suppose I lived in Los Angeles for too long to get too so that excited but yeah <laughs> it's, it's all very exciting yeah for us, it's amazing. They're, they are icons, aren't they? So there's some questions now. Um, so how hard is it to actually get tickets to go to the trade fair? All you need to be as an interior designer, go to um, Chelsea Design Centre in London. I think it's um, – I just Google it, you'll find it, and then you can just put your name in, your interior designer. They ask you, like, pages of questions – but just tell them you're in the trade, you're interior designer, you're from Australia, they're not going to be wanting to know too much else if you've made the whole effort to come over there. But, yes, there is a form to get that, um, you get this this um, this tag with all your information on too. So, yeah, so it's called, I think it's called D, what is it? Yeah, Design Centre. So if you go Design Centre London, and um, here we go. Here's, here's the website here. So dcch.co.uk. So if you go to that, dcch.co.uk, you can get all the information on how to sign up and just, you know, get on their mailing list. Yep. You might um, get some other information. Great question. Yeah. A couple of questions about um, some fabrics. So yes. um, what is what is wax cloth? Oh, wax cloth um, was a, um, a cloth that the Dutch East India Company used to trade to the Netherlands, right? And it was very popular. And it got so popular that then they basically started doing knockoffs of it. So it's actually a, a, a cloth that has a lot of um, history about colonialism. Has, it's kind of very weighted on that. And it's what the Africans um, wear in Nigeria um, and Ghana and around that area. So it's basically like, I suppose the closest thing you know is like barley, like um, what do we call that wax cloth in barley? people make sarongs out of and that sort of it's that same batik it's like a batik yeah yeah it's a it's an african batik but it's really strong colors really strong designs mm, beautiful um so Dilmeni's asking uh is there a rule of thumb in using different patterns in one space well as you can see from these images no um but i have a beautiful um aunt who's an English interior designer who definitely is probably my mentor in design and her formula is you need to have something shiny something matte and something with texture so if you can sort of like go with that as a basic formula you really can't go wrong um, 
it's it's really more is more at the moment um, but it's also really smart when you can color block it and we're seeing a lot of like in these images here the velvet it sort of gives your eye a resting space. Here you've got the sort of satin, um, I think this might have been a satin or a velvet. It gives your eye of a resting space with all this pattern around here, pattern on the cushions, and then this whole ottoman is patterned. Um, here it's more just about uniform, um, but it's all about really trying to find, move your eye around, but also give it a place that it likes to rest. So there's no hard or fast rule. It's just about balance. And it all comes back to the elements and parents' rules of design. That's it, isn't it? Because it, it, it looks so well put together. It's not plonked by any means. It's, it's been considered and thought through. But, um, yeah, it's not something, even though it's maximalism, it's still had all that process through the E's and P's of design, um, yeah, for it to look that way. Um, they make it look easy, don't they? <laughs> so somebody's asked, Steph's asked, um, do you think maximalism with all the ruffles uh, and the trims is something that will increase in popularity in Australia or is that more suited to English lifestyle? Great question, Steph. Okay, so I personally swing towards that because I like maximalism. Um, I love layered textiles. I do think it will go more that way. I think we're going to be so over the white rooms, the white boucle sofas, the um, we really want to put our energy into it. And we are a world of mix. You know, we, it's just not north and south, east or west. We are mixing all over. And we saw that really with our India Madhavi. She's, she's French, born in Tehran, mixes her collaboration with Yinka Shirabari. He's British, born in Nigeria. So we're because we're in a world of mix of um, nationalities and immigration and we're seeing more and more of that we're going to see more of these new um, patterns and arrangements and, and and ways of putting it together I think this is our way of showing our unique individualism so I do feel like it will keep moving I also feel color blocking is going to be strong at the same time so if there was my biggest takeaway would be to understand colour to its nuances. I even felt that I don't even, even though I teach it, I felt like I could almost like go back and like redo everything again and maybe do that foundations course and do all my colours again because it was the designers that were really strong on colour were the ones that shine and they're the ones that are making their mark out there they're the ones that are getting the book deals they're the ones that are getting the Instagram posts they're the ones so I really think that yeah if that answers your question it's 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 going to go that way for a long time because there aren't that many people that understand colour and that's really the long and short of it. There really aren't. And that's why we get these people that do these safe rooms of whites and beiges. Um, even though we know there are so many different whites and beiges, but that's why if you want to make your mark, you learn this because you will be um, really showing something. Look at Trisha Guild. She came on the map in the 70s from blowing up the English flower that was in these nice, pretty, safe colours and putting radical, really interesting colour combinations. And she's now got 30 books mm. and an empire. Mm. And she does all the printing for Ralph Lauren, James Deerwood, her own designs. She's mega, mm. but it all came from colour. So, yeah, that's, does that answer your question, Steph? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sure that has. Yeah, for sure. And yes, it does. Thank oh. you. <laughs> there you go. I was just typing back, but I'm too slow at typing. Oh, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I think um, I'm quite excited by the colour and pattern. I've got quite a few books by Kit Camp, and um, I just find it really fascinating how they put the different patterns and colours together. So it's really great to see all of this and know that it's potential for it to gain popularity yeah I think, and that's why I think yeah we have to look at not just um what we see in the magazines we have to look at society 
and look at the movement of people around the world. And that is going to show us where design's going. And that's what Kit really, she's a hotelier. She deals with people that move around the world. So her rooms, her designs are all about how do I work with all these types of clients? And she's made a life and a trend from mm -hmm. that. So, yeah. I've got another question from Annika. Um, what are your secrets to getting a client confident in using more colour and textures if they are actually quite cautious about it? Okay, great question, Annika. Um, okay, I'm working with a client at the moment. I'm trying to do that too. It slowly, slowly gets the monkey. I think you... Um, I've, I, well, I, all right, some of my little design secrets with my clients. Um, I, I say to them... Go back to your childhood and remember something that really was stood out in your house or your grandmother's house. And I guarantee you it wasn't the white sofa or the white rug. It was some pattern. It was, it was some sort of fabric. It was some carpet. It was a wallpaper. There was a pattern out there that really gravitated. So especially this works with, um, clients have children and say so is that how you want your son to see your house when he grows up or do you want him to know that there was this fabulous carpet um, so or I give an example my mother had this amazing three meter leopard skin sofa that you know was amazing and then she um, covered it in beige uh, I've never been so disappointed in my whole entire life um, so I sort of do it that way I also when I'm showing them the fabrics for like the sofa for the bigger parts of the um i also even though we're not up to shop designing the cushions yeah at that stage i'll throw in another little fabric and they'll go oh you know in that fabric seat you had um there was something there what was that for was that for the sofa i'm like oh no i just thought that that gold tone worked really well with your bno system so i just thought we could pull that out so you're starting to sort of like get them into thinking a little bit more so i suppose that's um where i go i'm not huge at doing um renders for them because then they hold on to that idea I've been caught by that um, with a client saying I wanted this like this it was like the render but the render's got the backlit screen and it's so much more punchier and all the rest of it so I as much as possible pull out the fabrics because it's tactile and you get them hooked onto it you get them touching it or you get the paint colors and you've got the brush out and you and you do I do a lot with my clients when I'm presenting a scheme I will present the mood board so I suppose Kelly Wurstler talks about vibe trays I kind of just put it on whatever table maybe on the kitchen bench and you know I'll put the paint um brush out and then i'll layer it on top with the tile or whatever so you're feeling like they're part of the design process and is very stiff um, this is how it works does that answer your question annika annika you there? Yes, it does. Thank you, Edwina. Thanks. Great question. That was that was a good answer, actually. I'm going to hear oh, that. Testing me. <laughs> I am. Well, you wanted the hard hitting question. I know. <laughs> I thought I'd throw you one. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I think that's it for London. Do you want to do Paris? Right, let's go on to Ooh. Paris. So after London, as I said, this whole design fair was a little bit of a COVID silver lining because normally Maison Objet is um, held in January. They also hold one in September, but it was held in um, January. They couldn't hold it because of COVID. And then all of a sudden, it was very quickly that they put it in March. So you could go to London first. There was a week in between the break where I saw my lovely um, interior design aunt and then I went to Paris. So unlike London where it's one whole um, basically place, a design centre where everything is, um, Paris it was a number of events. It starts off with Maison Objet. So that's the big event. It's, it's about 30 minutes by train out of, or we went by taxi out of Paris. Um, 
it is sort of near the airport in Paris Nord and not sorry Paris Nord out near Charles de Gaulle and it's seven halls so it's a big exhibition space then they have Maison Objet in the city which is basically showroom interior design showrooms that are on the left and right bank then they have Paris Deco Off, which is all the showrooms again on the left and right bank where they have all the fabrics, the wallpapers and all the textiles. And then they have Paris Deco Home, which is all the bathrooms and um, all the bathroom products and um, all the furniture. So it is kind of a whole week of just interior design wherever you walk in the streets it is just takes over um, they actually have shuttle buses for Maison um, Objet and Paris Deco off that just go to and from from um, uh, Saint-Germain-de-Prix through to um, um, Victoire's on the other side and there's just every like 30 minutes you can get a bus going to and from so the first one uh, the first day after I arrived I went to Maison Objet. Now I just realized that as a spelling mistake this is actually the correct spelling so if you're going to google it google it with this spelling not with the spelling that I have on the next couple of slides sorry about that. Um, so this there were seven halls and I would say that anyone that goes to Maison Objet start at number seven. I started at one going ah. Oh, this is just bric-a-brac. And then two, three, four, five, I started going, oh, this is interesting. Six, great, seven, amazing. So seven is like the high-end designer, um, the designers that's the pushing it um, on the edge, um, showing new ideas, and you have to be invited to show in seven. So that was what was really interesting. So um, all these little images are from Seven. And literally it was the hardest thing doing this presentation because otherwise I'd have you here for five hours trying to work out what I was going to show and what I wasn't going to show. But if there was one sort of standout um, that I think you should look at is up here called the Invisible Collection. If you um, look on their Instagram handle, they've got some really great um, they're an online um, French interior design company, but you can see all this sort of like, um, what was his name, Luke Edward Hall type spin. Um, this is them here. Look at this sofa, the way this is shaped. Just a little bit more edgy, just a lot of design. It's a, the designers that use them are really cool, so you can learn a lot more about some really edgy designers, and then you will see some of the um, Australian designers following them too. So that would be my biggest takeaway of someone that I thought, oh, I'm going to keep an eye out. But as you can see, 70s was huge. All this sort of 70s look, lots of patterning, but always anchored with a color. So the French were amazing with color blocking. Here you can see this carpet here where you've got this color blocking. They really understood how you can anchor crazy level layered prints with color blocking. So it was that, it was loads of shaped mirrors. Um, so let me just go, uh, sorry. Um, and just color blocking, color blocking, color blocking, color blocking was everywhere, plus a lot of pattern. Um, and also with this, they have, it is such a huge exhibition that you've got everything. So I just pulled out one little category. This was lighting um, and this was probably 0.5 of a percent of the lighting. It was, it was just small, but I just wanted to show you just the array of lighting that they have. This here is like about, I would say a four to five meter high Murano chandelier from Italy. So it is incredible. Um, if you look on my Instagram post, there's one client that I actually put together a Murano chandelier in her bedroom that was probably about just about as big as this. And that took me hours. So putting this together as an interior designer is insane. So that was one. Then they had this modern showing warm, cool LED lighting. Um, these lights, which you've probably seen around in children's bedrooms. Um, this is light was all made out of cut out paper flowers. 
multiples of lights to create a whole light arrangement and then lots of metal. So this was just, I was just pulled out some like just key images, but this was the same for tiles. This was the same for fabrics. This was the same for wallpapers. This was the same for um, furniture. This was the same for absolutely every category of interior design that you can think of. They had it there. So um, it's one of those places where you go with, lots of coffee because it's overwhelming on how much there is out there now of course they all want to know you some of them are represented in australia so that's easy others you get their card and they find a way to get it there um, but it is amazing it's incredible the creativity it was incredible the creativity on some of the um, stands and people were saying it was actually probably the worst year because obviously it was put together so quickly. Um, I bumped into um, Richard from the Partier Garden there who goes all the time. And he said that it wasn't as many halls as normally they are. So it, it's normally pretty amazing. It's definitely worthwhile. If you go in early, it's 50 euros to sign up for early tickets. Um, and then after that, they just keep going up in price so it does cost money to go to that unlike the Chelsea Design Centre which doesn't cost but to go out to this exhibition it does cost 50 euros the next day this probably was my highlight in Paris was going to the San Owen um, flea market and it is sort of at the end of the train line in Paris if you look on my Instagram there's a shot of me and it looks down um Paul Burt, which is one of the um, alleys. It's just nothing but alleys with garage doors. So I got there really early um, after reading all my Paris books about this is the place to go for furniture. Um, and it was just all shutters of garage doors. Then after they've had their cafe au lait and croissant, um, the doors start rolling up and there are these amazing displays of interiors um, and how they put them together. So everything that you're seeing here is in a garage door. They literally roll it up um, and they merchandise it. This here, you've got the concrete still here, you can see. Um, they paint the walls. The big takeaways here were white boot clay. I mean, white boucle was almost like, when in doubt, cover it in white boucle. Loads of 50s, sorry, 60s, 70s um, sofas, huge amount of rattan, but not the cheap, nasty rattan we're seeing out here. Beautiful, like 18th century French rattans, um, real craftsmanship. Um, really beautiful, amazing um, concepts on how they put it together in different art forms and design forms with lighting and tables. And it, it was really quite um, impressive how they worked with rattan. And then plaster, plaster mirrors. You can see this here, all this plaster, um, plaster light fittings. There was a lot of plaster, a lot of very sort of organic forms in plaster. So they were the three big takeaways, but really worthwhile going out there to have a look. Um, there were so many Instagrammable photos. I just don't know where to start. It was so great just to see what's out there. And really, it was lucky that you can only have so much luggage so you don't buy anything. But it was really, really impressive. So definitely put that on your list for when you're in Paris next. So here we are back to India Madave. So as I said, Maison Objet in the city was a sort of a spin-off from going out to... Um, the big halls and they have all the shops of all these designers so this is India Madhavi who we discussed with Sketch who was the interior designer for Sketch and she has three um, basically storefronts in within 200 meters of each other in the seventh R&D's month so this one down here is like her gallery this is where she plays this is where she plays out new ideas new color schemes um you know this is maybe something that's going in a new project it's not out there in mass it's just really playing around with color scale form um 
it's her little gallery of whimsy and ideas. Maybe it's a new rug design she's trying out. It's sort of a bit of sampling, but it's presented like it's this gallery. Then there is um, a showroom which has her furniture, which is these two up here. And here upstairs is where she, her design um, studio, where she designs. This is where her design clients would meet. Um, she should show them the furniture that she designs and her concepts. So this was, as you can see, color blocking, very strong, how she uses color. Again, she's got this sort of yellows and oranges like she had in sketch, very pushing that. Um, her iconic um, um, table stool that she's known for. And then about 100 meters down the road, she has a homeware store. So this is where it was filled with like velvet cushions. Um, this is her homeware store. It was a mixture of rattan and these color blocked velvet cushions, rattan table, um, velvet sofas. And you can see how like, you know, white on the side, you know, one side was one color, another side was another color. Uh, amazing um, color blocking. And if you do live in Sydney or you do come to Sydney, there's um, a great store on the corner of Queen Street and Monco Street in Wallara called Alum, A-L-M. And she is, she represents India Madave in Sydney, in Australia. And so it was very interesting coming back, going into her store to see all of these, but in a totally different color scheme, a color scheme that works for the Australian market. Not a colour scheme that's very heavy and very European, but a colour scheme that works in the Australian market. So Google Alan, maybe go on Instagram, look at that shop and look at her colours. They're all these sorts of pinks and yellows. They're all in these sorts of pastel -y tones. They're not in these greens and, and reds and the heaviness. Maybe because she's got more of the summer and this was more winter, I'm not sure. But it, there was a totally different level of color but still the same product um this is a design i've only come across when i was overseas which is one of the wonderful things about going overseas is finding new people she is this um designer i picked up this book over there um she's written a whole book on color and she's got this this book is just incredible it's basically got all her all her color palettes i don't know if you can see that and she has two stores, one on the left bank, one on the right bank. And um, this designer totally captivated me. One with her way she color blocks, one that she really understands balance in color. She really gets that sort of textbook 60, 30, 10 balance. She's got incredible um, application of the elements and principles of design. And she's really very commercial at the same time. So Annika, to get it over, this is sort of probably a designer that you want to start playing with if you're trying to move out of the neutrals into a bit of color because her colors are so muted that they work. So you could, without this red, this could be a neutral um, scheme but it's that red across there the tiny bit of red she puts around the lampshade here and then the tiny bit of red piping around that that just pulls that together without jumping in your face and then these colors here she's even names what that particular blue is of hers she's got this fabulous green but she anchors it all with this black and white so um, another designer that I think you should keep your eye out for look at her um, very commercial very easy to how she puts everything together. And then Maison de Volcans. So this is Nicholas. He's the designer of Maison de Volcans. Um, he sells his products through quite a few channels in Australia. There for that ease of French living, um, as you can see, their sort of wall colors are like when you do all those special effects, you know, like the Porter's suede effect or lime wash effects. They're very much that wabi-sabi um, concept of design. He's very into color. I took loads of photos of all his fabric sheets and how he worked the colors on fabric sheets. I've got about 20 of them, each in color. As you can see here, these are all these like color block and cushions with all the different textures that he has if you look on my instagram i think if one of one of the photos you scroll through you will see a video 
of all those cushions um, from that color all through to the blues, greens, purples, um, beiges that he has. So Maison de Vaucant, um, for that really slouchy, linen-y, um, but putting that sophisticated color, bit of fluff, bit of feather, um, velvet, very tactile, um, but you know, very ease of living. And then there's Deco Off. So Deco Off is all the streets of the left and right bank. As I said, you're walking the streets of Paris, you cannot be um, forgotten that you are in a design fair. So in the streets, in both the left and the right bank, they had all these lanterns hanging down the streets. Um, and they were all made out of textiles that were for the interior design industry. And then underneath was the name of that textile um, company or supplier of that particular textile, sometimes the name of the textile. So you would walk down these streets with all these fabulous lanterns and all these really beautiful textiles. And then either side are all the stores with all their textiles. And then they had sort of like art pieces in the middle of squares that had to do with textiles. So this was a textile designer with a huge oversized um, chair that was around, luckily it was around the corner from my hotel. So I got a few photos with me there. Um, but like on this side here is the showroom of Manuel Canavas. On this side here is Pierre Frey. Um, you know, you've got all the amazing textile um, companies there. So they have like nights where you're just walking the streets and popping into people showing their textile ranges. So this was quite a funny story. I'm walking down the street and um, they're like, oh, you know, um, they're Italian. They're having like, everyone's got champagne. Everyone's got food. Um, they're like, oh, well, um, where are you from? Australia. They're like, oh, we're Italian. Um, we're Cora. I'm thinking Cora, Cora name rings a bell I couldn't think about anyway they're like can we should give you a showing I said oh yeah they, they said oh we represented by South Pacific Fabrics I said, yeah I buy from South Pacific Fabrics um and then I'm like I clicked to me I'm like Cora I used your fabric in a bedhead for a client it was like $700 uh, made a bedhead of uh, fabric they're like I said and I was like looking through the ranges I'm like this they're like but that fabric is for a throw I said yeah I know but it looks great on a bedhead as well Anyway, so they were like loving it because here's this designer from Australia that's actually bought their fabric, that's put it on a bedhead that it wasn't meant for. So, you know, you meet all these friends as you're walking down the street because just because you're in the same trade and you've got interesting stories. So that was that was them. Um, this side here is the um, showroom of Jim Thompson, who's um, is he's owned by Pierre Frey, but he was a Nolan Free Silks from Bangkok. It's still based in Bangkok. And this was their new um, range. So they were, the name leaves me of this, uh, he's an American interior designer, long gone now, but he was all about Malachite. So this was their whole range. But you can see they've got wallpaper on the ceiling. This wallpaper is reflected into the cursions. They've got this backdrop of um, malachite in blue. The boxes were all malachite, all these layers of blue here. And I had just specified their fabrics um, for another client. And so that was really interesting because I mean, in Australia, we only see like this maybe a meter long piece. Um, here are these fabrics I specified in like three meter long pieces. So that was really quite amazing. This particular place here was um, I'm walking down the street. There's a guy standing in the street um, and he goes, would you like to come in? And I'm like, you know, well, this is Paris, right? And he's like, and then I could see um, the sign um, Fermentile which is a wallpaper, um, really high-end wallpapers. And he said, yeah, um, if you go up the stairs, up to the apartment on the second floor, um, yeah, there's Vermintal. So here I go up into this nighttime, as you can see all the lights. This is someone's apartment I'm walking to. They're giving us drinks. The wallpaper is this Vermintal wallpaper. It's an ombre wallpaper, so it's dark purple into orange. Um, the, this, is the, this is the person's bedroom. So you're into their bedroom. This is Fermental wallpaper, um, beautiful fabric. It's like stars, incredible. You went all through the area. You know, it was basically a one-bedroom apartment, but a large one-bedroom apartment. They were giving you drinks. They were showing you fabrics from other places, the sofas, 
came from Italy, the rugs came from somewhere else, but it was literally you were invited into somebody's apartment. So you could see how it was all. And Fermentol did this a few different ways. They were also out at the market in another stall that we went into. They had it all on the wall of this fabulous store that sold nothing but rattan. Um, they were in an antique store in another place in Paris so that they didn't have a showroom. So they used this way. So that was another sort of amazing happenstance it probably was on my map there was so many I mean these, these are like all the books you get to you know you, you can't read them all um and that was so that was just a bit of deco off which I have to say is so exciting it's probably more exciting than going out to the um paying you 50 euros so you save your 50 euros and just hang out there you're going to get just as much inspiration um one of my favorite favorite um designers is definitely Pierre Frey. Um, they're, they're based in Paris and this is their showroom, right? This is the guy that runs Pierre Frey. He is showing us their new collection, um, which is kind of funny because it is all based on the Boishol Ballet, which is Russian, and we know how popular Russian is, especially in Europe at the moment. Um, and so he had to keep saying, well, you know, we were working on this five years ago, it took five years before we launched this. You know, they obviously launched it before the war. They didn't realise what was happening, um, but it was all about... Um, you know, inspired by Russia. So he's talking about where they got their designs, who the fine artists are that um, were inspired, the constructivists, the cubists, all of that, um, and how the, the way the um, Central Asia, there's amazing e-cuts at St. Petersburg Museum where they got inspiration from. So he's discussing it. So this is his showroom. They also have furniture, rugs, um, wallpapers, and of course, fabrics. So this just to show you how they present themselves um, with all their different fabrics you can see hanging and, and it's just, your eye is just like taking everything in. There's just so much to take in, but all their fabrics are all hung on these three meter heights. So you see the full length of the fabrics. Um, always in Paris, it's always great to see what else is out there. Um, this is probably one of the cool hip um, concept stores at the moment if you do go to pa Paris go to Mercy it's um, a concept store um, and there's I, that is all about sustainability and um, really this is the people that founded it I can't remember where they made their money but they made a lot of money and so now they're putting it back in sustainability so you know at the front there's this um, go weaving seats through with rattan and, and all the different colors and you can order these seats with whatever color rattan you've got here there was this spare seat at this table I asked if I could sit down um, this was a Japanese um, concept because you know how much I love a workshop um, of um, kinshui and this is where you repair the broken plates with gold um, so here I am at this workshop with all these other French people who can speak word of French but why not art is a universal language and um, here we are mending plates with gold that we could take away which this is my plate here I actually have it so um, I don't know if you can see it, but this is my plate that I mended on that little workshop um, and it's also got a whole lot of homewares and just interesting ways how they put things together so just it's something Look, the French are known for their concept stores, but this is kind of a cool one. And then finally, as I always say, art and design, they're interrelated. Um, there was this amazing exhibition across six different um, museums and it was Yves Saint Laurent. It was celebrating 60 years since he first did his first collection. And I always love seeing artist studios and where they work and what, what, what their process. Um, and so this is, at the museum of Yves Saint Laurent where he actually worked, his atelier. And um, this is actually his desk. This is his area that he worked. Look at this at the back, all his little color studies. I think this is what made me want to go back to foundations and do color again, because here he is just working with gouache on all the different color um, combinations for his work. But what was so important about 
these six museums that were showing his um, work was how he was so inspired by fine art to create his most iconic designs. So here are a few. Here we have at the museum um, Picasso, famous Picasso. And then this is the Yves Saint Laurent um, jacket that came from his painting. This here, these colours here, were inspired by this amazing 60 metre um, fresco by Raoul Dufay. And here we've got the fabulous colours that he pulled from this mural to do these designs. This is a Matisse um, uh, fresco um, and this coat that he designed, looking at all the different line work and the colours and the tones. This is in the top of the Musée d'Orsay, um, where they actually did have a big um, ball there in the, I think it was in the 70s, and um, these are the, um, the, the, the clothes that were designed around that time, and here you've got the big clock, so it's very dramatic. Um, these were clothes inspired by Pierre Bonnard, and then you've got the Pierre Bonnard, who is a French Impressionist, and how they um, relate to the artwork. So that was my little wrap. I don't know if I've gone, I've probably gone way over time, but um, any questions? You did really well. You're right on time. So oh, good on you. You timed it well. I've got a question from Steph. Steph yes. um, Steph's on fire today with her questions. They're good ones too. Um, this one is where, where would be your go-to place for um, good quality rattan? You know what? It's so hard. I mean, there, the, the level that I my, my clients will pay for, it's like Globe West. It's those mm -hmm. sorts of, they're all, that's sort of probably the market that um, are doing it. The rattan that I was seeing in Paris was, you know, really 18th century rattan, where, mm -hmm. where, where it's coming from. It's, look, at the moment, boucle and rattan is such a strong trend. I think it's, it probably will last another five years. But I also think, yeah, rattan works for us, but make it good quality. Don't make it look like it's just super cheap out of the East. It's, you know, it's got to have some real strength to it and it's got to have some real form and design to when selecting for clients. Also, um, boucle, white boucle, it was everywhere. I almost thought if I ever ever see another piece of white boucle, I'm going to throw up. Um, I don't know if it's going to be so wonderful in our climate. It's wool or a lot of the knockoffs of polyester. You try sitting on that for a long time in our heat, I think it's just not going to fly, but it was there everywhere. So, yeah. Amazing. How, how have you found coming back from your trip, how it's inspired you in your practice? Have you? I realised that we have everything here. Mm. Right? I realised that there's nothing that we can't get here. Yeah. Um, and so I think that was really great. Um, it made me come back and realize I have to structure my business a little bit differently. And I really need to push more the design side of my business and less of, um, I think, because you get so um, intimate with your clients, you you can almost verge on that personal assistant from them, even though I'm charging them for the time. Um, I was my design was pulled away and it was more like following up, chasing, you know, I really want to put more design into my business. I think that was my biggest takeaway was restructuring my business. Mm, amazing. Thanks so much, Edwina. This has been an incredible yeah. insight and I bet it's inspired everybody to want to go overseas. Oh, it's just beautiful. Um, uh, Michael, you're off to do the same thing, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going to be interested to hear you. Wait, I'll turn my little video on. Can I turn the video yeah, on? Yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Um, that was amazing, Edwina. And what I really, really loved, um, because I'm someone who doesn't come from a background of textiles and colour, so it scares me a little bit. But two highlights for me from your presentation was 
one, the um, Abbey Interiors, um, where you've got that tapware and it's like, okay, let's throw something at it. Let's throw that commentary, playing with those layering of textiles and materials. I think that's something that we can all achieve. And, you know, as you just mentioned, become more of a design, like you're practicing your craft of designing um, through real products. And I think that's a good example, a great example. And the second one was when you're in Paris and um, the two designers, I forget the names. Now, the one that had the really slouchy furniture, almost like that MCM oh, house furniture yeah, yeah, and yeah. that Maybe khaki green. Yeah. And I was like, you're so right. That's almost like a neutral palette, which, you know, everyone kind of can achieve on their own by just going to the, the showroom. But you, it's been elevated. The artwork's behind it. The um, And the same with the that um, that red in the background and the, the red piping, you know, Sometimes it's just those tiny little um, finessing of a design, which just really elevates and takes it to the next level. So that were my two takeaways from the things that you, even if you're, it's that second nature isn't up there of that textiles and color, just try and push those little little elements, and you can really um, create something special. Yeah, it's almost like in your, on your desk, you should have your like elements and principles design chart. Your color wheel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You yeah, really just like going, how do I relate this back? You know, like yeah. if I can't, if I can't find three elements and principles of design into this design, yeah. it's not working. If I can't work out what that color theory is for that, it's not working. And I really think that that was my biggest takeaway. Yeah. And going back to Annika's question of how do you convince a client to do it? And well, if you've got confidence in your design and you've got confidence, hey, this relates to the elements of the design, I should, look what I've done here. If you say that with confidence and knowledge behind you, it, get, it translates to trust and like, oh, wow, this person knows what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah. So 100%. Oh, thanks, Michael. Yeah. To get a fellow educator, give me a pat on the back. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. I really appreciate it. It was a great turnout. So um, yeah. you can watch it back again later. I've um, recorded it for you and we'll pop it in the course. Oh, excellent. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks to all my students for popping in too. I know we didn't get a drop-in session, but I will see if we can put one in next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.